and get you on the mic so we can clearly hear and understood by Joe and Dahl. And then Joe will make a response. We'll just continue to do that for about an hour or about how long you're, you're still Hour. <laughs> <laughs> ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Don't worry. Joe came to serve, not be served. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so let's begin. Does anyone have a question? Okay, we should. And you might say who you are, too. Just say, I'm Stan from. Stan from Woodbridge. I know Stan. Dr. Cash. Um, since we were talking about judgment, uh, in the 22nd chapter of Revelation. You have it in the newer? Correct. Why don't you read N.T. Wright's book, then I don't have to explain anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But go ahead. So, so uh, in the 20th chapter, you know, the dead are judged, the great white throne judgment. Uh, that includes, in my opinion, uh, everybody, because everybody that comes up out of the sea, the ground, all of those that are not in the first resurrection, so to speak. But uh, in the 21st chapter, the new heaven and new earth come down, and the first earth is passed away, it says. Yeah. Now my question is, in the 22nd chapter, it says in verse 14, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. And here's the point. Um, outside of the gate are the dogs, those who practice magical arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So my thought is that this is more like a summary um, set of verses. It's not identifying that there's those outside of the gates. Right. Yeah, you're, if you're, yeah, it's not saying they're literal sorcerers, dogs. <laughs> yeah, right. it's, it's very poetic. Right. right, right. Because at that point, the new heaven and the new earth is there. There's no more of that sin going on. Yeah, those things are excluded from God's new kingdom. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So that wasn't a question. I guess that was just a confirmation. Of it. It's a confirmation. That wasn't a question. All right, so I'll need you to raise your hand if you've got a question. So, excuse me, so what, what is it? I'm sorry. No, I'm just wanting to make sure I understand the answer you gave you. Yes, that, that verse is saying that those, that, that there are people out, that, it, it's not saying that there are people outside committing all these sins. It's a summary statement saying that those things don't exist in the kingdom of God. Is that fair to put it that way, uh, my colleague here, Jeff McSwain? Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, what, I mean, I might comment on this too. Uh, in our past, uh, we read the Bible, Bible hyper literally. And uh, we didn't respect the figures of speech and the genre of literature that they are. And you know, you can. Uh, a nice way to see the error of that is if you were to read the newspaper the same way I have a lozenge in my mouth here I'm getting a little hoarse throat so if I felt like I'm sucking on something it's because I am <laughs> um, if you were to read the newspaper the same way it would, you don't read the, the cartoons the same way you read the editorial page the same way you read the sports page you know when, for example, when I read the sports page and I see the Cubs lost, they go, ah, there they go again. I don't, um, I, I don't go into a deep depression. Uh, when I see the cartoons, I generally chuckle. Um, and then when I read the editorials, that's when I usually say, Tammy, do, do we have any more of that bourbon? <laughs> you know, there's different kinds of literature. Um, our mistake was we would we were we were I, I use this term scotch tapers. We were scotch tapers. We would take a verse from the Old Testament. We would take a verse from the Gospels. We would take a verse from the Epistles, and we'd scotch tape them together like 
they all belong together in one paragraph. Well, they didn't, and they don't. Um, that, that's that's just not the way to properly understand the Bible. And you know, I'm not. I don't mean that as a a knock against uh, Herbert Armstrong. Uh, you know, he was a sincere man, but he was sincerely wrong and stuff. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's hard for us to escape some of those old habits of scotch taping the Bible and hyper-literal reading. And, but, but I think we God's led us pretty far away from that, a long way away from that. And, uh, we're still viewed in the Christian community as the, as the miracle story of the, of the century. Uh, I, I'm on the... Um, board of the National Association of Evangelicals. And there was about 85 or no, there's more than that, maybe 90 denominations in, in the NAE. And, uh, and they have board meetings twice a year. And when I attend those, you know, I meet the, the presidents uh, of different denominations and they all, when they see me, pat me on the back and, and say things like this, Joe, I'm encouraged just to see you. <laughs> and why that makes me feel good. Uh, there's a group in Utah uh, called Standing Together. And there are about, so, let's say 15 evangelical churches around Salt Lake City. And you can appreciate it, that's Mormon headquarters. It's dominated by Mormon churches. And uh, uh, because of our experience, they invite me to their, they have strategy meetings on how to uh, try to interact with the Mormon leadership and uh, uh, make headways and have dialogues with them. And they, and they invite me, in, in private meetings they want to hear what I have to say, but they invite me to attend meetings with, with the Mormons. And I said, you know, I, I'm just curious, why do you invite me? Because uh, I don't, I'm not really interacting with any of the Mormon leadership. And they said, <laughs> they said, Joe, you are the poster boy <laughs> for transformation from the fringe to the fold. And you just being here is uh, a sermon just standing there. I. Uh, That's, I, I'm humbled by that, but boy, I, no one ever told me I could be a poster boy. <laughs> I, I still wonder why Tammy married me. Uh, she's she's uh, way too fetching, good looking to be married to me. But, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'm from uh, Richmond, Virginia. I, I, I know. I'm glad. Uh, Jeff explained it there, but there's a question about the interns. Now, we, we do have an intern, and very excited about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, all, these, uh, now all these interns, are they uh, committed to be pastors in GCI, or they're just, you know, going through a process, you know, of training? Well, I, committed to I think it's a mixture of both, but I'll let, I'll let uh, Jeff McSwain answer that, because he can speak more directly to it. Thank you for that question. I'm honored to be here with everybody and uh, honored to be a part of the intern program. This is the second year. And it's a, it's a bit of a risk to, uh, to bring on a young person and ask them to say for sure that they feel called to ministry for the rest of their lives at that age. And so if we sense that they might be called to that kind of vocational ministry and they sense that they might be then they can come in and explore with us for a couple of years. And we really feel like if we love them really well and give them the wraparound support with coaching and mentoring and, and, and teaching through the seminary, that after that two years, there'll be a very good chance that they'll stay with us. But we don't sign them up like an ROTC. Where yeah. we tell them, they have to be, they're all the good. So we want them to be propelled by their heart's desire as God strengthens it into ministry instead of out of obligation. Thank you, Jeff. I'm quite uh, impressed with the caliber of uh, people we have in the internship program. Uh, I've met, not, I haven't met all of them, but I've met most of them. And every one of them, I think, my goodness, they're way more mature than I was at that age. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, God
God has really, really blessed us with uh, a, a lot of good leadership coming up the ranks, so, so to speak, from the 20-somethings to the 50-somethings. Uh, you know, I'm, I, uh, I'll, be, I'll be filing for Medicare next year, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, my time to pass the baton is uh, is approaching, and I'm glad to say we have some really, really good candidates that uh, I, I'm happy to pass the baton to. And I'm not going to just disappear when my time comes to retire. I'm going to stay active and do stuff. Uh, Mike Fazell, you might recall him. He's since he's retired, he stays active. He helps pastor our Long Beach, California church. And uh, he really enjoys doing that. And uh, I, me, I'm tempted to uh, probably start a house church in my neighborhood. And I, I've been praying about that, and thinking about that, talking to a few of my neighbors. And, and so far, uh, I've, only, I've only asked a handful of guys. <laughs> but everyone I asked said yes. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's a good thing. So I, I, uh, I've lived in this neighborhood for 15 years, and it was a brand new housing development that went in 15 years ago, and so I was one of the first 100 people to move into the place, and, and, uh, and Tammy became the neighborhood watch captain because they started one of those neighborhood watch programs, and so we really got to know all the neighbors on well, our side of the street and across the street and around the corner, and got to know them so well. And this is really humorous to me because uh, they seemed to like Tammy a lot, but they weren't sure uh, what to say to me because I'm some kind of a preacher man or something, and, uh, and not just some kind of preacher man. He's uh, he supervises preachers or something. Anyway, uh, this one neighbor across the street uh, who's retired, uh, and I love telling this story, we have one of these uh, communal mailboxes where the post, postman comes and puts them all in our boxes. We go there with our key. And so whenever I'd be going up there to get our, the mail, I, I'd cross the street. He, he lived, it's right in front of his house. And he'd see me coming, and he'd turn around and go back in the house. <laughs> and this wasn't just once or twice. I saw this uh, at least a dozen times or more. And so this one time, I, I thought, I'm going to catch him. And I waited till he had his back to me. And then I, I quick-stepped over there, and I opened my mail, and I said, Hey, how's it going? He, he was just, <laughs> And I did that a couple times to him, and he finally said something to me. He said, "You know, uh, yeah, you're you're uh, you're you're normal." <laughs> I said, "Well, thank you, thank you." And he said, "He said I was afraid uh, to talk to you." I said, "What on earth for?" And he said, "I thought you could see through my soul." <laughs> Guy. <laughs> and I said, look, uh, I don't know what kind of experiences you've had with preachers, but uh, there is no preacher on this earth that can see through your soul except for our Lord. <laughs> and if anyone tells you that, he's lying. And now this guy is my buddy. Uh, in his garage, he, he, he has every... He, he's like a Bill Wynn. He has every possible tool uh, you can imagine. And uh, I was planting a tree in our front yard, and I was busting my back with a pick and a shovel. And, and I'd gotten, I, I had to go down about you know, two and a half feet for this palm tree I was planting, and I was probably uh, eight or ten inches and working hard. And, and he said, stop, stop it. And I, why? He said, wait, wait. And he came running out of his garage and he had this post hole deer tool. And he just went, bam, bam, bam. I was done like with five hits with this thing. And it just, it's, it's weighted and it just, uh, God. Anyway, I didn't even know there was such a tool. And I, I was done planting that tree in like five minutes. And I took it back to him and he says, yeah, now, 
Don't hurt yourself like that. I got, look at all these tools. <laughs> so uh, so he's, he's my buddy now. So I, I asked him what he thought about coming over. I said, I don't know if I'm going to do it once a week or once a month or what, but maybe something in between. And, and I said, you know, I'm going to retire in a couple years. And I, I was thinking I'd start that then. He said, hey, well, look, you better start it before then. I might be dead before then. <laughs> So at least, at least my, I've got some friends in the neighborhood now, and uh, I. And what's funny is, I except for one of them, I haven't done anything socially with any of them. It's just all the kind of you know eight stroke conversation in the neighborhood, and uh, I, but it's going pretty positive. I, and, and my my idea, since I'm giving full disclosure here about what I might do, my idea is to do this around. Brewing and drinking beer, <laughs> and and I have a name for my my group that will meet hopefully once a week. Theology on tap, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know I'll probably say let the knowledge of God flow. <laughs> but uh, men like to drink beer, and uh, I mean I can see us sitting around and uh, discussing things and. Uh, Praying and then uh, having a few beers and watching the football game. I, I just see this natural thing developing in my neighborhood. But you know, yeah, Tammy doesn't know if she's included yet. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joseph, it's uh, great, great seeing you again, uh, personally. And thank, thank you for being here. My, uh, my name is Gary Cloth. Um, I, I attend church uh, in Vienna, Virginia, suburb of, suburb of DC. I live in Falls Church. Um, basically, I have a question about the Old Testament. Um, I, well, one ministry I support a lot is Plain Truth Ministries, Greg sure. Albrecht, and I, I just thought reading a book by Brad Jersak about a, a more Christ-like God, <laughs> and uh, and I believe that a main theme of that book I just, I just thought reading it is that um, you you know you know God by Jesus Christ, uh, and what I, what I'm really concerned about is I mean one thing one. One uh, thing that follows from that is you interpret the Old Testament uh, through Jesus Christ, right. and um, and I I, I like to, I like to know how what how you think the Old Testament should be interpreted or how our denomination sure. uh, think, thinks it should be interpreted. Um, I, I guess I guess they would say if something in the, in the Old Testament uh, shows shows a picture of God that's different than Jesus Christ, you, you might you should maybe reject it or maybe question. Was it built by an editor that didn't belong there? You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure really how to interpret the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I, I, I believe that, you know, I, I firmly believe that, yes, you, interpret, you see God by through Jesus Christ, you interpret the Old and New Testament through Jesus Christ, period. I really feel strongly about that. But I'm thinking that maybe, you know, Jesus, maybe uh, Jesus, Jesus exercises more tough love than, than maybe we, we might tend to think. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, maybe people are, are too kind of too quick to dismiss things in the Old Testament that seem harsh, mm -hmm. but you know, uh, I mean, like Jesus seemed kind of harsh, like a little bit, like in Revelation two and three, he uh, he went pussy footing around with, with a couple of those churches, you know. So how, how should we view the Old Testament? Well, I think you answered your own question, and I think it's an important one. The uh, and and, I, and especially in our experience in history. It's an important question because Herbert Armstrong's approach was to interpret the New Testament through the Old, and uh, and it's just the opposite of how you should interpret the Bible. Uh, I, I, I liken it to uh, you ever pick up a, a telescope or binoculars and look through the wrong end. <laughs> uh, you see through it, but you you don't see how you should see through it. And when you look through the right end. Uh, and the right end in this case is the new is written to interpret the old the, the, through the lens of Jesus. And Jesus himself tells us that in John 5, 39. He said, uh, you know, you, you guys search the, uh, the Bible uh, looking for eternal life, and it's testifying of me. So you should feel very strongly about that, and you are correct to do so. Uh, that Jesus is the only lens through which the Bible can't be interpreted. And it makes perfect sense because if we're to know more about God than what we can see in nature, God has to send someone. And he sends Jesus. And uh, so uh, I, I haven't, I, I'm familiar with uh, the name Brad Jersick 
and I know he's written a book that Greg has uh, promoted, but I, I haven't, uh, other than seen the cover, I haven't read the book, and I, I don't know even what points he's addressing in the book. But uh, but uh, just a word on, on Plantry's ministry, and uh, you know, Greg's uh, uh, approach to theology is the same as ours. He's uh, he, he's not riding some other horse. <laughs> And uh, and Greg and I are are, are good friends. <laughs> we still go out together and uh, have have lunch and uh, talk about our families and life and and uh, reminisce. <laughs> Greg, you know, Greg is uh, one of the instrumental people who uh, was supportive of me in all this transition, and uh, so I consider Greg a, a good brother. He <coughs> unfortunately uh, when. He spun off the plain truth uh, as a separate ministry that was misunderstood by a lot of people. Uh, it's not like Greg uh, just took the magazine and ran away with it or, or left us. It, this was something we had agreed and planned to do for 10 years to spin the plain truth ministry off uh, into a separate, uh, its own niche ministry. And when we got to the point where it was time to pull the trigger and do it, um, some of us had second thoughts. We said, man, you know, things are turning out pretty good here, and maybe we should not spin it off, and maybe we should keep it. But Greg and Monty Wolverton and a few of his staff, that was their hope and their dream, and they worked towards that for several years. And so when Mike Fazell and I came along and said, we're having second thoughts, but we'll leave it up to you. They uh, said, "Oh no, this is this this is what we've been waiting for," and they've done quite well. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of some of uh, you know, Greg's got a very small staff. Uh, Laurie Arista is his uh, assistant, and she's a member of our church and sings in our choir at Eagle Rock. Uh, uh, Dennis Workington is his main man, uh, the guy who takes care of his warehouse and. And facilities and, uh, and and Dennis's uh, wife Maureen is our uh, human resource person and uh, they both attend our Eagle Rock Church and Monty Wolverton is retired now and Monty's an elder in one of our churches in Oregon so uh, so we're still we, we still have a close connection with them but we but we're doing separate ministries. And, and the purpose of Greg's ministry, and, and Greg had a hard time uh, finding the right balance on this, he's trying to minister to people who've been abused by churches. That's his niche. That's the purpose of his ministry. And unfortunately, when he, when he does that, uh, it sounds like to us, and well, not just us, but many Christians, that he is got a weak ecclesiology and uh, it doesn't think that churches uh, are a necessity. And of course, personally, that's not the way Greg feels. I mean, he, he realizes the church is the bride of Christ. Who, who, who wants to put her down? <laughs> but uh, in, in the fine, it's like walking a tightrope in trying to minister to the, young, to the abused who no longer attend church. Uh, he, he'll make some statements that well, the church community hears it and say, "Well, that's that, that. We don't agree with that." So, so in some some measure, Greg has hurt his ministry uh, and supporters of his ministry by that. But and, but that was just a necessary part of the process of his moving his ministry forward. But I, I'm supportive of Greg, and we remain good friends. Unfortunately, I'll say that Greg has some of the people he's partnered up with have weak ecclesiology, unfortunately, but um, but Greg himself does it. He's a good fellow and remains an elder in our church. But good question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Carla McKee and I'm um, from Baltimore. Welcome to Maryland. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to be here. I, uh, the only place I've ever been in Maryland, Maryland was in the Washington, D.C. area. I didn't know this place existed. <laughs> it's pretty nice. Um, my, my 
question. Actually, I had this question um, a couple years ago, and for some reason it popped up again in, in my head since this questions and answers. So um, I, I noticed it seems like more recently there's all these, these TV shows about people listening to people from the dead or, you know, stuff. There's all these shows around, you know, that. And I've always in my mind had a certain opinion of, you know, all of that type of thing and all and then but then I'm like okay where when I'm confused if I'm confused about something or you know I'll try to find where in the Bible is there an example of this or did yeah. this happen or whatever and the only thing that comes to mind is the witch of Endor I think it's Endor I think yeah. it's in Samuel yeah. so and when I read that story um, it's I guess the question that I had was, okay, was this Satan playing around, or was this God? Right. Was this of God as far as what happened, and you know, and Samuel coming back saying, "Why'd you wake me up?" and all that. Right. So I just want to know just a little more clarity on what was going on with that. Sure. Uh, most of that stuff, people talking to the other side, or talking to the dead, is just bogus. Uh, I'm, I'm always entertained and amused and find, I'm finding it hard to stifle laughter right now as I talk about it because uh, I've read about it and I've talked to some uh, uh, professional hypnotists and, and uh, they have terms for the skills that you can learn to do this. A cold read or a warm read or a hot read and uh, if you watch some of those shows which it seems like you have, you know, they'll, they'll say things like Okay, I'm uh, I'm getting a signal here from someone. Uh, someone's died. Uh, someone, a family member died over here. Um, begins with M. M. Mother. Yeah, it was your mother. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Name began with F. Was it father. Father. Okay. So anyway, it's, uh, they do. They have techniques that they learn and become actually quite skilled at uh, and, and reading uh, nonverbal. Clues, you know, uh, when we communicate, uh, the the voice and the words we speak are like thirty percent of the communication. Seventy percent are nonverbal clues, and people study that. And in fact, you could take courses on that at some universities, and it's a fascinating field to study the nonverbal clues. But most of that stuff is bogus. And any time that something genuine might happen, then I would be suspicious that that's demonic. And, and, and I praise God that I haven't had uh, to deal with the demonic very much in my ministry, but I've had some episodes where we cast out uh, a demon, and, uh, and that, that's just not something I, I enjoyed getting involved with, but I was there, and I was the one that had to, and I, and I, I did. Uh, in, in the case you're citing in the, in the Bible, even the, even the, the people, the witch, the witch knew it was bogus, but even the witch was surprised that Samuel appeared. So if, if that account is genuine, then the only way someone, and you, I think you would understand this, the only way someone's coming back who's dead is if God performs some miraculous intervention to cause it to happen. But uh, that does It's all bogus. That Most of that stuff is just, they take people for their money. You know, they have people, there's one who, who talks about, uh, I, I can't think of her name, but if she really, it, her batting percentage is something like 30% in the stuff she predicts. So if she can't predict any better than that, I, I, how can I believe she's talking to dead people and telling them, well, oh, yeah, your, the, your little pet dog is with, with mom too. <laughs> um, please. So it's just bogus stuff. Now you see me, now yeah, yes, sir. Tori. Yeah, I guess Tori Van Acker <coughs> from uh, Fairfax, Virginia. I guess thirty percent is a pretty good batting average if you're a baseball. Yeah. Wasn't <laughs> um, good enough for the Cubs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was uh, intrigued by the the comment about the interns that uh, yeah. the GCI programs put out uh, put forth, and uh, that seems to always put the focus on the young that we can bring up into the leadership. And you know, I retired two years ago from the seven to seven job, uh -huh. and now I have a new lease on life. Yes. 
and it, I don't feel like going into the sunset like maybe some people do. And I'm just wondering what opportunities or what thought has been given in the GCI denomination to use people who are free of the shackles of the 7 to 7 job and maybe still helpful enough to be able to do any kind of service? I'm guessing that 40% uh, of our pastors are people like you. So we've given tremendous consideration to it and are being served very well by it. Uh, and the, the process for getting involved is is getting involved uh, in getting a relationship with your uh, district coordinator who is it Randy Bloom? Oh, PD. Yeah. So PD would be the one to talk to to get you on the path to where you want to go on that. But well, I, we're, we're huge fans of uh, of our elders being retread <laughs> and, and going on that path. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question for me, but, but we're big on it. Okay, this is going to be the last one because it's 9.35. <laughs> and I know some of you are thinking I'm on California time. <laughs> Since August till now, I've been this whole eight days. I don't know what time zone. <laughs> and uh, in fact, when I was just home those last four days, because we just had some planning meetings uh, in, in Glendora, I found it hard to get up uh, to get to those meetings, and those meetings were at 8 o'clock. And, uh, and it's earlier here, for crying out loud. <laughs> so I have this whipsaw effect of going to Italy and back here and then the London and back here and, and then I was in Michigan and, and this just keep going back and forth. Um, I, I could go to sleep and do at, at just any moment I can. <laughs> so with that preamble, <laughs> last question. Okay, I'm Rita Williams and I'm from New Christian Community Church with Pastor Calvin. And when you were speaking, you mentioned that you were a positive universalist. Okay. A hopeful universalist. Hopeful. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah. Hopeful. Okay. All right. So, I my question at that point was: so, what is the opposite of a hopeful universalist? And you know, our our theology implies a number of factors that. Uh, appear to be universal and yet I know we are different from what yeah. the universalists as a denomination says so if you could comment on that I'm going to draw you a chart I'm going to give you more information than you imagine okay. <laughs> and, and sure. along the sure. same sure. lines sure. since this is the last question I had too <laughs> <laughs> there are uh, um, so the other part, it ties in a bit. Uh, sometimes in my work, I work with a population of substance abusers. Mm. I keep you guys on the radar mm. when you start your tap on your theology on tap. <laughs> 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 However, um, you know they, the approach to spiritual conversations is referred to as a high power spirituality. Right. The AA stuff. Yes. And and so and you know, people that I work with have different beliefs as well. You know, they have they practice yeah. Buddhism and it, yeah. you know, different different kinds of theologies, I guess is what it amounts to. And so I'm always wrestling with how do I I, I have to say high power when I'm dealing with my clients. Okay? Sure. Yeah. yeah, and so, but at the same time, I'm inwardly trying to figure out ways to um, in, to filter in what is true about who, who the true God is, who God is, and how that pertains to their recovery. So, I think, like, some of that's all kind of linked to universalism when we're hearing these different conversations and people calling God different names and creating different categories of ways of approaching it. And I just want to be uh, maybe a little more um, keen on how to engage in dialogue or how to present or how to position myself in a way that 
uh, hope that I stay, I hold true to what I know is true, and yet, um, anyway, I think that's it. Yeah, the difficulty is, of course, uh, your employer and what, what your employer would allow. If your employer allows uh, you to ask the person, are you a Christian? Do you believe in God? Shall we just call the higher power God? No, we can't do that. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Yeah. So then you're hamstrung. There's not much you can do then. You still have to refer to it as a higher power. What happens if this, you're working with this person off-site? Or if they're not in your facility where your employment is? Oh, fat ones, yeah. <laughs> I think what I'm asking is not, like I know I can't. You know you speak. can't do it? Yes. You mean, how do you stay on track? How do I stay on track? Well, you know, you know that God is the only higher power. Yes, that's right. So I don't understand why you would worry that you would go off track. Um, and that's, I'm not formulating my question well. So because okay. I'm not worried well, about we'll, this. We'll take this one. This, yeah. this will take a while. Okay. There, there's um, in, in in Christian history, all of Christian history, there are only five views on the fate of the evangelized, unevangelized. And the first view has several different, it goes by several different names. Sometimes it's called particularism. But, uh, but essentially this is uh, the Protestant view, and, and I'll just put P for particularism, that if you don't accept Christ before you die, you're burning in hell for eternity. So every, everyone knows that one, right? You, that's, that's the first view often called particularism. The second one is called U universal opportunity. So I'll just put UO there. And universal opportunity means that everyone uh, meets Jesus Christ before they die. And the way that happens was explained well by a guy named Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas said, uh, and I, I, I like his explanation for what it's worth. He said, as humans, we really don't know the total point of human death. And in the twilight of someone's life, and I think in modern times, we can very well understand this because people have been clinically dead for up to 40 minutes and then are revived and no brain damage. And wow, how, how did that happen? And what Thomas Aquinas said is that point in the twilight of their life, when they're clinically dead or before they die, is when angels minister to them. And th th that happens to everyone before they die. So that there, there is no person who's never had a witness of who Jesus is. So he, uh, he, he's, he was the champion of that view. And I think, I think Clement of Alexandria, if you want an old guy, an early church guy also thought that view was right. Anyway, uh, that, uh, but both, what, what these first two have in mind is that the point at which you, you uh, die, you must make your profession of faith or you're roasted in hell. Now, this one's imminently more fair because this one has the fact that no one is left out. Everyone here is a witness of who Jesus is, even if it's by angels before the final death. This one, uh, their explanation is, yeah, well, if um, if you don't get your witness of Jesus before you die, you are in that group that were decreed to be damned forever. So, doesn't matter. Okay, this third group, uh, third position, is called inclusivism. So, the big eye there. Inclusivism is what um, C.S. Lewis is explaining in his book, The Great uh, Divorce. And, and, and I think you'll all agree with the point of logic he raises, that when you or I or any human dies, God isn't suddenly handcuffed and, oh no, I can't do anything now. He died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 in, in his book, he, he uh, He's, you know, this is just a story he tells in his book that 
Like annually, there's a bus from hell, and they get to ride up and see what heaven's like. And uh, most of them, you know, they experience God's love and forgiveness, his pain, and so they don't even want to get off the bus, but every once in a while, someone gets off the bus. But that's inclusivism. Then the fourth one is called post-mortem theology, P-M. And uh, this is what the Roman Catholics teach. You know, <coughs> seven levels of hell, you got purgatory, and uh, you know, if you pay enough money or say enough prayers, you get to move them from, I forget how many levels of hell there are. Do you, you remember, Jeff? It's 11? I think it's 11, but anyway, and, you know, so that, so with Dante and I mean, they turned it all into you know like a big game of parts. You know that game where you got to get your token into the center. Uh, not only was this the Roman Catholic view, this was our former view. This was Herbert Armstrong's former view. All his three resurrections and a hundred years and a thousand years. So you know, HWA had stuff in common with the Catholics. And this last view is called universalism. And that, that teaches that um, it doesn't matter. Everyone's going to be saved. Now, when I say I'm a hopeful universalist, I am hopeful that everyone does embrace and say yes to Jesus at some point through time. But I'm not a universalist in, I don't think, like universalists do, everyone's automatically... That, that just goes too far. It, it, the Bible doesn't teach that everyone is going to say yes to God's yes. Uh, but it does teach that God says yes to everyone. So the hopeful part is, I hope that everyone says yes back. That's what I mean when I say hopeful universalist. And this one was championed by a, a guy in the early church named Origen. And uh, yeah, he, he, he had, there's some strange stories about Origen. And he read those verses about, uh, um, you know, if your eye offends you, pluck it out, or, you know, if you're sexually uh, uh, tempted. He, 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 so, according to some sources, he castrated himself. Uh, I, I think that he took his theology to an extreme. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Origen is the one who taught, not only is everyone going to know, automatically uh, say yes to God's yes, but even the devil is going to repent. And, uh, and so, yeah, we don't teach universalism. So my phrase, hopeful universalist, only points to the one thing that I hope may be true. Everyone eventually will say yes, but I don't know that. I just hope they will. Anything you want to add to that, Jeff? Or? Uh, every Christian should have that hope. I would think. Yes. Yeah. And uh, if uh, if I wasn't uh, in some kind of jet lag state, I would. My memory is not it's not coming strong. I, I used to be able to name you like five people that hold each one of these views. Uh, one from the early church. Like I know this is origin from the early church. <coughs> I know this is R.C. Sproul here, yeah. if you've heard that name. Uh, John Piper, you know, five-point Calvinist here. But uh, from a, some, some from, from, I'm going to say, a, an evangelical fundamental view, they see these two first positions as orthodox and these as uh, more heretical. But who died and left them in charge. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, that's it in, in a summary nutshell. I, I wish I could uh, understand your question on the, uh, what, what you're saying about referring to a higher power, but I, but I don't think, you're not worried about yourself no, going off track. Okay. No, but, um, yeah, you can only say what your employer allows you to say. You know, in those kind of clinical settings, uh, you find out you're evangelizing on the job. Uh, they don't want you to do that. I take it. No, no. That's yeah. That's. I think it's, it has to do with how to have a dialogue. Um, 
in a way that conveys what I do believe without professing that this is but yeah, so you so your your employer doesn't even allow you to say, well, for me the higher power is God. Right. And wow. mm -hmm. yeah, because that Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> I'm I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right, it's ten to ten. Oh. <laughs> All right, can we give it to a hand? Yeah. Thank you for participating. Thank you.